Okay, so the first question, this was a top voted question by Alina. And the question is, what are the most common causes of fragmented sleep and nighttime awakenings that last over an hour? And which strategies or nutrients do you recommend to improve sleep continuity and continuity and depth? Melatonin is one that people really turn to a lot of the time, you know, especially older adults that are making less melatonin. You don't want to really take a super, super high dose of melatonin, but some people can take, you know, less less than three milligrams, three milligrams or less, right? One to three hours before bed. Um, it works for some people. It doesn't work for everyone. It's certainly great when you're traveling and you have jet lag. That's a that's a great time to take melatonin. Another supplement that people like and sort of has a calming effect on the nervous system is magnesium. So when you're very stressed out, your body uses up more magnesium because magnesium is required to make energy. Stress requ- requires a lot of energy. So does physical activity, right? All these things are using up your magnesium. And so taking a magnesium dose before bed, that's typically what I do. I take I take magnesium glycinate. Um, it does seem to, ha- people do seem to think it helps improve their sleep. Also, L-theanine is another one that might be helpful. So it, it's one of those calming amino acids. It's found in green tea. It doesn't it, it doesn't really sedate you, but it kind of, people think it helps quiet the mental chatter. And so there have been, there was a 2025 review that actually analyzed 18 clinical trials and they found very small but meaningful improvements in sleep latency and quality, especially if people had mild anxiety, if they took L-theanine. So um, the dose range was about 200 to 400 milligrams at night. And again, um, it does seem to help some people. Glycine is another big one. I've been hearing a lot of people actually come back and and give me some comments on glycine and how if they take it about 30 minutes to an hour before bed, that their subjective sleep quality the next day is much better. Um, Even if they're measured, even their sleep tracking data seems to be improved, fewer nighttime awakenings as well. And so, um, the dose that that seems to be the sweet spot there is about three grams of glycine. And this is something that I'm personally uh, going to be experimenting with. In fact, I just ordered some glycine. So um, stay tuned on that. And then myonositol is another one I talked about before in the past. It, it's not a sleep aid as well. And it, you know, it, it does, definitely doesn't have strong evidence as being a sleep aid. But it, again, it helps with some of those sort of mental chatter and, you know, whether or not it's placebo or not, it seems to help me. Unfortunately, fragmented sleep is strikingly common. There's There are large data sets that suggest that like one third of U.S. adults experience, you know, these sleep disrupting awakenings at least three times per week. So it's it's a problem for sure. And there's a lot of different potential things that can cause nighttime awakenings. Now, there's obviously things that are like medical conditions. So just barring those, you know, so we have obviously insomnia would be one, right? So insomnia would be something that would cause it. And a solution there would be cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI. It's a really, really, I would say, tried and true method for improving insomnia. But another one of the medical conditions to check off the list would be sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. And so that definitely causes frequent nighttime wake awakenings. Um, a CPAP machine obviously is something that's very beneficial and has been shown to help treat those nighttime awakenings in people with sleep apnea. And then another condition that people don't often think about, but does really play a role in fragmented sleep is what's called nocturia. And so this is where you're frequently having to urinate in the middle of the night. Now there's medical medical conditions that can cause this. So you know prostate enlargement definitely is one of them. You hear a lot of older men talking complaining about this. Another one would be um, overactive bladder. Some women complain about this especially after having multiple kids. But I would say the biggest concern for most people without any medical conditions would be nighttime fluid intake. And this is something that I've experimented with pretty excessively. And for me, it's very clear if I drink fluids pretty close to my bedtime, I will have to wake up to go to the restroom and urinate at least once. And that does disrupt my sleep. If I abstain from really drinking fluids like a couple hours before bed, like maybe I'll have a couple of sips, 
but I'm not drinking a glass of anything, no glass of tea, no glass of water, then I can last the whole night without having to urinate and it it really makes a difference. And so that is also something to keep in mind. Another obvious, I would say, cause of night frequent nighttime awakenings would be psychological stress, right? So outside of medical conditions, our mental state plays a huge role in our sleep. So anything that's causing you anxiety, depression, if you're having any kind of physiological arousal, like, I mean, anything, it could be as simple as, you know, you read an email too close to bed and it was, you know, from your boss or it was some kind of, you know, emotionally arousing email or something like that. Obviously, that anxiety can keep you alert and that will definitely cause frequent nighttime awakenings. And so making sure you keep your stress level under control is also extremely important. Now, let's talk about the environmental causes. I think that's what a lot of people are interested in. Um, One that not a lot of people think about and including myself until I had a discussion with Dr. Andy Galpin a few months ago was the sort of irregular sleep schedules and or bedtime routines. And um, and it's really true. Like if you have this irregular erratic sleep schedule where, you know, you're working really late or you're, you know, you've got children or extracurriculars are getting you home late or whatever it is. Like when you, if you usually go to bed, let's say you're in bed and, and like eyes closed by 10 p.m., if something's keeping you, if something in your life is making you get into bed an hour later and then you're not closing your eyes until 11 p.m., that disrupts your sleep as well and causes frequent nighttime awakenings. So erratic, irregular sleep schedules are something to really consider. You want to really have a routine. You want to have, you want to try to stick to it as much as you can. Obviously, life gets in the way and you can't always do that. But as much as you can, that is something that you want to try to do. Alcohol consumption, I talked about this last summer when I released the alcohol episode. Alcohol consumption, one of the major, major things it does is it increases nighttime awakenings. Many people consume alcohol in the evening because they think that it's actually helping improve their sleep. They think that because alcohol does reduce what's called sleep latency, so you do fall asleep quicker, but it's the trade-off of your sleep will be fragmented and you will have frequent nighttime awakenings. And so you definitely want to try to avoid consuming alcohol within, you know, I would say at least a few hours of of bed, going to bed. The other thing that raises, um, sorry, that increases nighttime awakenings is late night eating. So there's a variety of reasons here. You know, I've talked to Dr. Sachin Panda about this and You know, he's mentioned that you don't want to be digesting food while you're sleeping because, I mean, that's obviously activating the sympathetic nervous system. You're digesting. It's, you know, it's awake time. Your body's thinking this is awake time. And so that is something that can cause nighttime awakenings as well um, as it raises blood glucose levels and insulin levels. That increases your core body temperature. If your core body temperature is up, that's going to cause you to wake up because your core body temperature is supposed to fall and that is important to help you sleep better. So that's another thing to consider as well. You want to stop eating at least like three hours before your your natural bedtime. Caffeine intake late in the day, obviously something to consider. Excessive exposure to blue light late in the evening also can cause nighttime awakenings. And certainly if your room isn't dark and there's like ambient light coming in, that also can do it. And then there's Things like noise disturbances, you know, your bedroom temperature is not right, right? It's too hot or too cold. All that stuff really does affect your sleep and it causes frequent nighttime awakenings. Aging is another thing to consider as well. Um, So as people age, they have reduced slow wave sleep. They have lower melatonin production. Um, They have more lighter sleep, less restorative. And so that you can be awakened really easy. So let's say you have to pee just a little bit, you know, that can wake you up, right? So like, there's all these things that can happen. And then for women, obviously, menopause related symptoms, like those things also disrupt sleep as well. So let's talk about some of the factors that we have control over that can perhaps influence the way we sleep. Obviously, the first off would be good sleep hygiene. This is always the foundation one of the most powerful steps here 
I've talked about this for many years. Dr. Sachin Panda is the one who really brought it to my attention 10 years ago, and that is getting early morning bright light exposure. You want to get that bright light exposure at the very least 30 minutes after you wake up. This is very important because it resets your circadian rhythm. This is the internal clock that helps you fall asleep naturally at night. It also helps switch off melatonin in the morning, which makes you more alert. So that is very, very important for having a normal sleep cycle and sleep schedule and avoiding that erratic sleep schedule that we talked about. On the flip side, it's really important to avoid blue light after sunset. And actually, before I get into that, I want to mention to get back to the the question from the chat today for shift workers, if you are shift working and let's say your daytime is nighttime and so you can't get, you can't go walk outside and get early bright sunlight first thing in the morning because your morning is night, right? In that case, you want to get one of those 10,000 lux blue light lamps. And there's a variety of them on the market. All of them are pretty good. And essentially use that within the first 30 minutes of waking up, get that bright 10,000 lux of light. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of lux light. That's really, it's really important. Um, and that will help reset your circadian rhythm because other words, otherwise what happens is your body is so confused because the light that you, the lights that you switch on in your house are just not enough to signal to your brain this is the morning, you know, the sun is out, it's I'm and resetting your circadian clock. That doesn't happen. And so you end up never really resetting it the right way. Yeah, you build up sleep pressure and all that happens, but your internal clock is out of whack. And so you want to be able to reset that clock every single 24 hours, every single day. And so the way to do that if you're a shift worker is to get one of those blue light lamps. Very important, 10,000 lux. And on the flip side of that, it's very important to avoid bright blue light at night, right? So after sunset, you're, we all switch on our lights. We have all this blue light in our houses, you know, and it's basically tricking our brain and telling our brain it's not nighttime. We should still stay awake. And so your brain, you're not making melatonin in your pineal gland and there's no sort of switch to like indicate that it's time to go to bed. So you can, you know, the solution to that is you can get light dimmers or you can get these red lights that um, essentially are not blue light because the blue light is what's the problem. So a variety of fixes for that. And that really does um, help. Obviously, this is something we've talked about before, keeping your room dark, very important. I've noticed this every time I travel. um, It's never dark enough. (laughs) And I really have problems sleeping. I get frequent nighttime awakenings because there's too much ambient light coming in um, the the rooms. Now, some hotels are great and have great blackout shades, but I've had many, many hotels that are not. Please try to stick to a regular bedtime routine. We talked about this, like anything that is signaling to your brain, the pattern that you do, whatever it is you do, even if it's not like this calming thing, it's just something that you do. Like I, you know, my husband does the dishes before bed. I do the cooking. He does the dishes. It's a great, it's a great, you know, collaboration. So that's what he does. And I put our our son to bed. And so like my bedtime routine is like I put our son to bed and then I like wash my face and brush my teeth. I sit in my bed. Sometimes I'll read a little bit, but I'll I'll listen to some like relaxing music. And that's my routine. And if you can train your brain, what happens is when you're just doing that routine, your body just starts to calm down. Your brain starts to calm down. It's like this, it knows. It's like this anticipation. Okay, I'm anticipating that it's time to calm down, time to wind down and relax. Obviously, bedroom temperature, we mentioned that as well. Um, Air conditioning helps with that. If you don't have air conditioning, having a bed that can cool itself like an eight sleep is, you know, I think another important factor there. Because sleeping in a cooler room is ideal and it really does make a big difference. Your core body temperature does drop at night. It prepares you for sleep. In fact, melatonin plays a role in doing that. So you want to make sure that you're sleeping in a cold room. Um, And paradoxically, you may think, well, then why would I want to do something like the sauna before bed? It actually... A temporary rise in your in your body temperature triggers this cascade of hormonal effects that actually promote deeper, more restorative sleep, 
once your body cools back down. And so if you do like a hot tub or a sauna about two hours before you go to bed, which is what I like to do, it it, it can actually not only, you know, it not only doesn't impair your sleep, it improves your sleep. And then we talked about the eating component as well. You basically, I have absolutely noticed if I, if something happens and I have dinner later, closer to my bedtime, I'm hot when I'm laying in bed. I'm hot. I'm like, why am I hot? And it's very much been traced back to it's the times that I've had dinner outside of my normal time and I've had dinner like right before bed and it's terrible. I I sleep terrible those nights. And so you want to really try to stop eating at least three hours before bedtime. Your body starts to make melatonin naturally three hours before bed. This is not only important for sleep onset and like preparing your body for sleep and lowering your core body temperature. Melatonin prepares the whole body for sleep, for rest. And so it actually shuts down the production of insulin in the pancreas because the body is going, okay, it's rest time. We're not going to be eating right now. We don't need to be making insulin because we're not going to get glucose. So in fact, if you do eat before, you know, within those, you know, hour or whatever before bed, your melatonin's already been, you know, risen. And so you're not going to be making as much insulin. And so you're going to have elevated blood glucose levels. Yes, it has metabolic effects that are not good, but it also activates your sympathetic signaling pathway. So you're basically going to have an increased body temperature, increased alertness. And these are basically both under, you know, undermining our, our sleep quality. And I've noticed this on many accounts, in fact. So um, it is really, I think, important that you want to stop eating three hours before you go to bed. Try to do that. Caffeine is a, obviously a no-brainer. I mean, you don't want to be drinking coffee. I hear some people say they can drink a cup of coffee and go right to bed. I don't believe it. I mean, I believe they can go right to bed, but I don't believe that it doesn't affect their sleep architecture, their sleep awakenings and all that. Caffeine delays the circadian rhythm. I mean, it's absolutely a fact. So avoiding caffeine later in the day is always good. And then alcohol, of course. The best option is to skip it all together. If you are going to drink, you know, at least four, four hours or more before your bedtime can at least help reduce the impact it has on frequent nighttime awakenings. 